Welcome to this video on the history of the Garou from the tabletop role-playing game Werewolf the Apocalypse, also known as the genocidal murder furries of the world of darkness. This is one of my more difficult recordings to do, just because werewolf lores spread out all over the place. But I think I have it about where I want it to be. Werewolf is not my favorite setting, but I'm going to try and power through it and do it justice and keep the snark level to a bare minimum. So, without further ado, the history of the Garou. Before getting to the Garou, the werewolves themselves, I need to lay out the mythos of Werewolf the Apocalypse. According to the Garou, one of their two patron deities, Gaia, is both the universe creator and the embodiment of all that exists, material or spiritual. Just beneath Gaia are three fundamental forces or concepts, chaos, stasis, and entropy. These forces have a variety of names depending on who is talking about them. Generally, the Garou refer to them as the Wild, the Weaver, and the Worm. The Wild is primordial chaos from which abstractions, ideas, and possibilities emerge. The Weaver imposes order upon chaos, taking raw chaos and transmuting ideas into stable, material forms. The Worm devours the Weaver's oldest or weakest objects, leaving the Wild with new space to fill with unformed chaos. Or a Hegelian dialectic imposed upon the universe. Wonderful. Below this triad were a host of Celestines and Incarna, incredibly powerful spirits of nature and the closest thing that humanity might recognize as gods in the sense that they are self-aware and could be appealed to in some form. Two of the most powerful of these spirits, Celestines, are Helios, the Incarna of the Sun, and Luna, the Incarna of the Moon. And self-awareness is a bit of a problem. In the mythic prehistory, everything was humming along just fine until one day, the force of order, or stasis, the weaver, became self-aware, and subsequently went insane. Which makes sense in a way. The weaver had the power to shape the cosmos, but was powerless to resist the compulsion to do what it had been created for, to impose order endlessly. Unlike the convenient disappearance in a puff of logic so popular to teenage atheists, the weaver instead metastasized. It would impose absolute order, perfect stasis on the universe, or living death as some might consider it. Nothing new would be created, and nothing would ever be destroyed. To accomplish this, the weaver first tried to trap the wild in its webs of stasis, but the nature of chaos resists order and the wild slipped through the weaver's webs like water. The worm, however, was not so lucky. The great devourer was caught in the weaver's webs of stasis. The more it tried to eat its way to freedom, the more the weaver spun webs around it until it was finally trapped. In being trapped and unable to perform its function, the worm also became conscious. In being denied its purpose, the worm also went mad and its newfound consciousness fractured into a thousand small godheads, each with a fragment of the worm's original purpose, to destroy, but without its overwhelming power. So the worm spirits, forced to operate within the weaver's pattern, worked to corrupt and rot away the weaver's creations, rather than destroy them outright. The worm of entropy had become the worm of corruption, and began a ceaseless attack not only against the weaver, but against Gaia as well. The worm's prison would become known as Malpheus, a hell realm containing every form of suffering, cruelty, and depravity imaginable. The story of the Guru begins with humanity, or at least what we might recognize as humanity. So let's say 50,000 to 100,000 years ago, give or take. The weaver took special interest in humanity as they were not blessed by Gaia with either claw, fang, hide, or horn. They were just naked, shivering apes hiding in trees and tall grass. But the weaver looked at early humanity and saw possibilities, creatures that could be molded to aid in its goal of perfect order. She gave the humans two gifts, rock and fire, and then waited to see what they would do. When the weaver once again directed its mighty attention at humanity, it was pleased by what it saw. They could take rocks and make tools and weapons to kill wild beasts and cut their hides into shelters and clothes. 
they used fire to warm themselves. The weavers knew adopted children could make even more complex tools and spread across the earth, given time, in search of greater prosperity. Now we turn to the Garu. The Garu were not the first shapeshifters created by Gaia. In fact, they may have been created comparatively late to others, like the Makole, the Saurian shifters, the Rokia, the shark shifters, and the Ananazi, the spider shifters. Whatever order the Garu were created in, what is beyond dispute is that the Garu were collectively the most lethal of Gaia's creations. A Garu, one-on-one, -on -one, is an engine of destruction, but there are shifters which are stronger individually. Again, the Mokole, when roused to anger, the Rokia, the Guru, the Bear Shifters, the Khan, the Tiger Shifters, and the Simba, the Lion Shifters. But the Guru are referred to as the fangs and teeth of Gaia. Just as one tooth might cut, a mouthful of teeth tears out the throat of prey. The strength of the Guru is the pack, unity, coordination, willingness to sacrifice oneself for the good of the whole. The original Garu pups were known as the first pack. According to the Silver Record, Grandfather Wolf took the cubs into a deep forest and left them alone for three months. For those three months, the cubs whined, howled, ran, and fought with one another. But when the Garu were attacked by a group of Bane spirits, servants of the Worm of Corruption, the first pack stopped fighting each other, came together as one, and killed them. As the Garu could change shape from man to wolf, they were capable of existing among both humans and wolves, eventually mated with both, and produced more Garu, some born as humans, others as wolves. The Garu's purpose was to protect Gaia and her creations from the worm, who had been driven mad from its capture by the weaver. As humanity spread across the world, the Garu followed their favorite humans. Eventually, some of them realized that humanity would spread beyond the ability of the Guru to dominate. Some Guru advocated for wiping out humanity entirely. Others said that humans should be taught the Guru's ways and how to live in harmony with Gaia. What came about was considered a compromise at the time. The systematic culling of the human race to keep the population at, well, acceptable levels. This was the beginning of the Impergium. So, the Impergium. The Impergium begins around 10,500 BC. The Impergium, or as it is otherwise known as Werewolf Systematic Murder. It was around this time that the tribes of the Garu began to form, as they selected particular groups of humans to cull or breed with or both. Add on to this exchange between the Garu and spirits, as the tribe struck bargains with their respective tribal totems and were required to abide by those powerful spirits' demands, and you end up with some interesting results. The tribe of the Red Talons became the most open and ruthless enforcers of the Impergian, given their general disdain for humanity and their preference for wolves. The Get of Fenris adopted a policy that the weak were deserving of death anyway, so better sooner than later. During the Impergium, there were two notable migrations of Garu away from the Eurasian continent. First, and because it's the easiest, the Bunyip tribe rejected the Impergium entirely and not only left the Garu nation, but simply disappeared. In truth, they traveled through the Umbra, the spirit world, to Australia. The Bunyip then sealed off the entire continent from access by umbral travel and avoided killing the aboriginals who lived there. The other great migration was the departure of the tribes known as Wendigo, Croatan, and Uktena, collectively known as the Three Brothers. According to the Wendigo, they originally dwelled in Siberia, where the Three Brothers engaged in a conflict with the tribe known as the Ged of Fenris, who had taken it upon themselves to call humans that the Three Brothers considered their own. At first, the Three Brothers fought the Ged of Fenris. After a time, the Uktena crossed the ice bridge into the Americas and wandered the continent. They returned and convinced the other two tribes to leave Siberia for this new land without Garu and to bring their favorite human and wolf kin with them. When the last tribe crossed the ice bridge, the three brothers raised the sea over it so that none could follow them. The three brothers and the Bunyip would not meet their fellow Garu again for thousands of years, and their reunions would be disastrous for those lost tribes. As a rule, 
Undesirable consequences are not unforeseeable consequences. And after 3,000 years, the Impergium had some undesirable side effects. The Guru were not subtle in their murder of humans. When they decided to engage in their culling, they typically used their most powerful shape, the Krinos war form, half man, half wolf to do so. This had the effect of inflicting a deep-seated genetic terror in the human race upon seeing the Krinos war form, called the Delirium. But the Delirium varies depending on the strength of will of the human viewing the Guru. The killing of humans did not discourage humans from breeding. It in fact had the opposite effect. It encouraged humans to breed even more, to expand the population, and increase their overall likelihood of survival. The Guru's general practice of culling the weak, or those they considered to be weak, had the effect of strengthening the stock of the humans who survived. Humanity was not only getting more numerous, they were getting stronger over time. And after 3,000 or so years of being hunted by big furry terrors in the night, the survival of the fittest had made humanity into something troublesome. Humans started building walls and weapons, working stone and metal into items that could kill Garu and kinfolk and the Garu are not the only creatures of supernatural power in those ancient days. Some humans, in their dread of the Garu, made bargains with other beings, powerful spirits, witches, and blood-drinking monsters. In exchange for protection from the Garu, early humanity set these creatures up as gods or kings. Finally, humans went to open war against the Garu, at least according to the Bonars tribe. Confronted with this problem of their own making, the Guru met in a great conclave to come up with a solution. The Guru from the Red Talons tribe once again called for the total extermination of humanity. The Get of Fenris wanted to rule humanity outright. The Silver Fangs tribe were quite baffled that humans did not simply submit to their obvious betters. The Children of Gaia, the Glass Walkers, then known as the Warders of Men, the Silent Striders, and the newly created tribe of the Stargazers advocated for the end of the Impergium, each for their own reasons. The children of Gaia and the Stargazers claimed that the Impergium violated Gaia's will. The warders of men had imposed the Impergium from the beginning and had undermined it for as long. And the silent striders made the rational and Darwinist calculation that if the Impergium applied enough genetic pressure on the human species to advance it to the point that they were even having the conversation about how to deal with humanity, then continued pressure would necessarily advance humanity to the point that they could eventually turn the tables on the Garu, which was beginning to happen. Despite what some Garu tell themselves, they are neither invincible nor are they untouchable by humanity. So the Guru reached an agreement, known as the Western Concordiate, the most important precept of which was the Veil. The Veil was effectively the concealment of the existence of the Guru from humanity thereafter. But the damage was already done. There would never again be peace between humanity and the Guru. Humans would hold the wolf as a special predator worthy of total eradication, create deadlier weapons and stronger walls, consume more and reproduce as quickly as possible, all to stave off the ingrained scar of death left on their collective psyche by the Impergium. Within the walls of the cities, the weaver and the worm had fertile ground to cultivate their human allies, allies that the Guru had so helpfully driven into their arms. Also in prehistory, the War of Rage was a conflict between the Guru and the other changing breeds, brought about by the Guru's arrogance, the Pharaoh's pride, and just a little manipulation from a servant of the worm. None but the Naga, the Ware Serpents, recall the reason for the War of Rage's actual beginning. In addition to the Impergium, the Guru laid a great deal of pressure on the other shapeshifters to submit to the Garu's claim to be the greatest warriors and therefore the rulers of all of Gaia's children. Naturally, the other shapeshifters, being proud creatures and having their own roles that were in no way inferior to the Garu's, rejected the werewolf's claim of rulership over them. Things only became worse when the Garu attempted to cull humans who were under the protection of other shapeshifters. And once you get a nice full pot of boiling water, all it takes is a little baking soda to overflow it. Around 2000 BC, a naga named Venata succumbed to the whispers of the worm and assassinated a Garu warrior and prince of the Silverfangs tribe 
named Petros the Unyielding, who carried a message from his father and king to Constantos the Savage to cease harassing the pharaoh. Constantos reacted to the murder of one of his tribe and kinsmen about as well as you might expect someone nicknamed the Savage to do. He flew off into a rage and killed a Bubasti, one of the werecats, blaming it for Petros's death. Constantos then brought Petros' corpse to the Gural, the werebears, and demanded that they perform the rite of fighting the death bear, which would restore Petros to life. The Gural tried to explain the reasons behind their refusal, that Petros's life had ended when it was meant to. Constantos instead attacked the Gural. The battle, or slaughter, claimed the lives of five Garu and two Gural. The remaining Gural fled to the Grandir, the werebores, for sanctuary. The Gural and Grandir, now thoroughly aggrieved by the Garu's arrogance and bloodlust, launched a counterattack against the werewolves. This was the start of the War of Rage. To say that the War of Rage was devastating would be an understatement. Several changing breeds were wholly exterminated by the wrath of the Garu. The Ratkin suffered the loss of an entire aspect of their species. The Mokole were not only driven from their most valuable nests, but further slandered by the Garu as servants of the worm, based on their Saurian war forms. The sacrifice of the Apis, the Were Aurochs, prevented the Garu from pursuing the Mokole, the Bastet, and the Ajaba into sub-Saharan Africa. The Grandir's kinfolk were either killed or enslaved, and in a bitter irony, they who had been tasked to cleanse Gaia of the worm's corruption fell to the worm themselves, becoming the skull pigs. As for the war's end, the Ananazi, the were spiders, claim credit for it. First, they tempted the Korax, the were ravens, with tales of a priceless treasure in the heart of Malpheus that, if shattered, would destroy the worm forever. The Korax, having laundered the origin of the information, related to the werewolves of the Fianna tribe, who in turn related to the rest of the Garu, who marched dutifully into Malpheus to destroy what they believed was the heart of the worm. But it was actually the prison of Queen Ananasa, the creator of the were spiders, who had been trapped in an opal by the weaver. The combined might of the Garu was sufficient to just crack the opal, just enough for Ananasa to once again communicate with her children, but small enough to prevent the worm from tainting her. The Garu were outraged by this deception, but by the time they returned from the Umbra, they found most of their fairer enemies had disappeared and assumed that they were dead. From then on, they considered themselves to be Gaia's sole protectors, a task that it would become apparent over time was too great for them to carry. A few centuries later, as civilization was getting up and humming, off in the Nile River Delta, the Silent Strider tribe made its domain amongst the people of Kem, or Egypt. Kem was embroiled in a secret, millennia-long war between the family of the gods, worshipped by the people as Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Horus, against their malevolent kin, Set. Unbeknownst to the humans of Egypt, Set was a vampire, a particularly powerful vampire called an antediluvian. Set's greatest rival was his nephew, Horus, the one-eyed king and leader of the Shems Heru, a group of warriors and magicians granted the power of resurrection. The Silent Striders fought their own war against Set and his followers, occasionally allying with Horus's Osirian League to battle the serpents. Exactly how Set managed to expel the Silent Striders from Egypt depends on the different tellers of the story. Some claim that the Silent Striders managed to attack Set in mass. Others claim that a great Silent Strider warrior named Shu Horus and his kinfolk lover, Nephthys, wounded Set long enough for the others of the tribe to imprison him. What doesn't vary is that Set laid a powerful curse on the entire tribe that affected their true name. Set cut off the Silent Striders from the Umber of Egypt. They could no longer regain Gnosis from any cairn in the land, nor would the spirits of their ancestors answer them. No Strider could even sleep peacefully in Egypt, as they would be haunted by visions of biting serpents and the screams of their ancestors. Within a year of Set's curse, all of the Silent Striders of Egypt either died or fled the country, never to return. Meanwhile, another tribe of Garu, the Fianna, made the island of Ire, what is today Ireland, part of their territory. 
but when they arrived, they found it occupied by the Tuatha de Danann, the ancient children of the Dreaming, who would one day give birth to the Fae. The Tuatha were embroiled in a war against a race of creatures known as the Fear Doman, shortened to Fomorians. The Fear Doman would spread terror and destruction across Eyre during the fall and winter and depart in the spring. The Fianna identified the Fomorians as servants of the worm and went to war against them with the help of the Tuatha. According to the Fianna, the final battle of the Fomori Wars was fought at the Plain of Towers, which is today Moitura County, Sligo, Ireland. The battle lasted from sundown to sunup and saw the deaths of Prince Nuwada of the Silver Arm, who fell slaying the worm beast Krom Kruak. The battle's end came when the chieftain of the Fomorians, Balor of the Evil Eye, was slain by his half-breed grandson, Lu. The Fomorians broke and ran, boarded their ships, and sailed west, never to return to Eyre. The Fianna consecrated the battleground as the cairn of the Red Plain, but suffered greatly for the victory. The best of that generation had fallen in battle, and their allies and kin, the Tuatha, soon departed for the mystical land of Tir Nanog, leaving Eyre in the hands of the Shi and the Fianna. Over a millennium later, the coming of Rome to Britannia put them in contention with the Garu of the Isles, including the Fianna, the Geta Fenris, and the White Howlers. The White Howlers were a tribe of contrasts, savage and fatalist in equal measure. They proved their courage to themselves and the Garu by a practice known as Dancing the Spiral, in which a White Howler warrior would descend into the Umbra, near Malpheus, the lair of the worm, fight a battle, and return. Around 200 AD, the White Howlers had corrupted themselves. Rage against Rome's devastation of their kin and sacred places, along with the continuous forays into the spiral, resulted in them going too deep. They began calling on the power of the worm to aid them in their battles and corrupted their kinfolk with bane spirits. Finally, many White Howlers entered Malpheus itself of their own accord as they danced the spiral downward to their doom. What emerged from the pit were white howlers no longer. They became Garu in service to the worm, the black spiral dancers. Not all of the white howlers were transformed right away, but enough were to plunge the tribe into a secret civil war. The white howlers' own reclusive nature worked against them, as no one, save for the inquisitive Korax, were aware that anything was amiss with them until it was too late to stop them. The last pure white howlers were dragged screaming into the black spiral labyrinth to be broken and reborn as part of the tribe of the worm. Around the beginning of the third century AD, the newly created black spiral dancers laid siege to Silver Tara, the Fianna's great castle in Ireland, in what would later be known as the First Battle of Tara. Garu history goes quiet for a few centuries until the discovery, or rediscovery, of the Americas by the Europeans. The Shadow Lords crossed the sea with many others of the Western Concordiate. Like the rest of the Garu, the Lords learned no lessons from the War of Rage. When the Balam and the Kamazots were discovered to have made their lairs in Central and South America, the Garu attacked them to take possession of those cairns, places of spiritual power rich in Gnosis. The Kamazots, Luna's other messengers apart from the Korax, were of particular interest to the Shadow Lords. After centuries of unsuccessful war against the rightful masters of the Balkans and Carpathians, the vampires of Clan Zemitsi, the Shadow Lords instantly mistook the Kamazots for Zemitsi. The proof of their guilt was the Kamazots' Krinos war form, which resembled the Chiropteran Marauder, the monstrous bat-like form accessible only to Zemitsi elders, and the preferred form of the lethal voivode Vladimir Rustovic, a notorious slayer of Shadow Lords Garu. By 1521, the last Kamazots was slain at the hands of a Shadow Lord. The last Werebat's death scream echoed throughout the Umbra. Once again, the Garu only realized that slaying an entire breed of shapeshifters was a bad idea after the deed was done. In the late 16th century, the Croatan tribe learned that one of the aspects of the worm the Eater of Souls had gathered enough strength to manifest itself in the material world, an event that, if not the apocalypse itself, would be close enough as to be indistinguishable. Under the leadership of their chieftain, Wanchis, as many Croatan as could be mustered journeyed to Roanoke Island, 
off of the coast of what is today Dare County, North Carolina. The victory of the Croatan did not come by force of arms, though a mighty battle ensued against the Eater of Souls. The Croatan victory and the salvation of the world came through sacrifice. The Croatan enacted a great ritual, offering not only their lives, but their souls to cast the Eater of Souls back into Malpheus. Every last Croatan at the Battle of Roanoke Island met their deaths. Those Croatan who were too far away to join their brothers and sisters were shunned by the spirits until they joined their brethren in death. Turtle, the Croatan's tribal totem, fell into a deep slumber from which it has never awakened. The Croatan's kinfolk never bore another Garu. The Uktana and the Wendigo have mourned for their lost brother for centuries and taken as many Croatan cairns as they could to protect them from corruption by outsiders. Nearly two centuries later, on the opposite side of the world, another tragedy would prepare itself, one that played on a repetitive theme in Garu history. In 1788, the first fleet arrived in Botany Bay from England to make use of the recently discovered land of Australia as a penal colony. Aboard that ship were European Garu and kinfolk, some as crew and some as convicts. To the Garu's surprise, the Bunyip were present in Australia and had changed a great deal in the millennia since they left the other Garu. The Bunyip were few in number and possessed almost no rage but an abundance of gnosis. What's more, they did not breed with wolves at all, but with the native thalassine, a nocturnal predatory marsupial that was already near extinction by the time the English arrived. To the European Garu, the Bunyip were clearly an inferior breed, mating with aboriginals and thalassines, and could hardly be called werewolves at all. The Bunyip regarded the Garu with contempt, as violent maniacs, and refused to deal with them or open their cairns to the Europeans, which only enraged the Garu further and you know what happens when a Garu becomes enraged. Back in the Americas, the deaths of the Croatan were felt centuries later. Millennia before, when the Uktena, Croatan, and Wendigo first arrived in the Americas, they defeated and bound a powerful bane beneath the earth of the western United States via a network of linked cairns. After the Croatan died, those cairns that were not claimed by the Uktena or Wendigo either fell inactive were into the hands of the European Garu who spoiled the ritual bindings. Sometime in the 1830s, the ritual was weakened sufficiently for the Bane to escape the bindings and emerge once again. Even worse, the Bane located and devoured a powerful weaver spirit and became a new creature entirely, capable of tearing apart the gauntlet, consuming entire towns, and destroying entire packs of Garu. This hybrid spirit, known as the Storm Eater, would terrorize the umbra of the American West for decades after. Also, in this age of American progress and manifest destiny, the Garu's worst enemy in the Tellurian would be born under rather innocuous circumstances. In the 1860s, following the Drake oil strike of 1859, Pennsylvania was flooded with oilmen, land speculators, con artists, and all of the other human refuse that crawls up when a rich, untapped, and mostly unowned natural resources discovered. Amidst the chaos of fortunes being won and lost overnight, a man named Jeremiah Lassiter and his partners filed papers to create the Premium Oil Company in 1865. Lassiter's business acumen, ruthlessness, and help from some of his more questionable acquaintances soon catapulted him into the strata of men like John Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and Cornelius Vanderbilt. By the 1870s, the Garu in the western United States were aware of just how devastating the power of the Storm Eater was and that they were unable to match it. The Uktena convened a council with a handful of European septs to ask for their help. In December of 1889, the Two Moons Pack returned from a quest in the Umbra to the heavens themselves where the Incarna made their home. They gave no details on what happened in that holy place but reported that they had learned a rite from one of the Incarna, the rite of still skies, that would weaken and bind the Storm Eater, but only at great cost. The rite called for the sacrifice of one of the greatest heroes from each of the 13 known tribes, the Bunyip were not in on this, at a network of 13 linked cairns to give the rite sufficient power. Before the month was out, 13 Garu of the sixth rank, each legendary in their own right, volunteered to give up their lives, 
On December 28, 1890, the 13 Garu heroes, each located at one of 13 great septs, began the rite of still skies in unison. As the rite proceeded, Garu across the west engaged in battle with lesser but still powerful banes that were seeking to disrupt the rite and prevent the Storm Eater from being bound once again. As the 13 gave their lives and passed into the Umbra, the local spirits responded by fueling their web of magic with power of their own. The Storm Eater was stripped of its power gained from devouring weaver and wild energy and pulled down, miles below the earth, to slumber once again. Two years later, following a series of fatal accidents at one of his Pennsylvania oil fields, Jeremiah Lassiter went on site to attend to the safety problems and more importantly, the work stoppages plaguing the drill site. Lassiter entered a newly dug hole where the dead miners had been found. To his horror, he discovered their killer, a powerful servant of the aspect of the worm known as the Defiler. Bound to the land by the long dead Croatan, but still conscious and able to act, albeit in a limited way, such as killing intruders and feeding from them. Lassiter, confronted with his imminent death, offered everything he had, including premium oil, to the creature in order to save his own life. The worm beast was intrigued by the proposition. Corruption, after all, was in its nature, and it saw that this oil company had the potential for rapid expansion if handled correctly. The bargain was struck, and Jeremiah Lassiter emerged from the tunnel. No more miners died, but perhaps it would have been better than what happened that day. Over 20 years later, in either 1913 or 1915, the board of directors of the Premium Oil Corporation restructured itself as a holding company. Its oil interests were spun off into a corporation called Endron. Premium Oil itself was renamed Pentex Incorporated. Pentex soon began buying up shares in smaller firms, seemingly at random. And now, we return to Australia, to that tragedy I mentioned developing a little while ago. By the 1830s, the Aborigines had been mostly uh, neutralized in Australia, thanks to the efforts of settlers and squatters, with more than a little help from the Black Spiral Dancers, who encouraged such practices as removing Aboriginal children from their parents in order to be quote-unquote civilized. This had the intended side effect of decimating the Bunyip's human kinfolk, reducing their already tiny numbers. But the real prizes were the Bunyip's cairns, which they managed to protect for over a century from both Garu and Dancer intrusion alike. The Black Spiral Dancers, however, had prepared the killing blow from the Bunyip, one that would come at no cost to themselves. A Black Spiral Dancer named Mara the Scream murdered Greyfling, the sister of the Australian Red Talons Alpha, and deposited her body on the edge of Bunyip territory. The Red Talon, Wormbaiter, learned of his sister's death and demanded vengeance from the Bunyip. The Red Talons, with the support of most of the Australian Garu, who also coveted the Bunyip's cairns, hunted down and murdered every last Bunyip in Australia. The Garu did not learn, or bother to learn, the identity of the true culprit until it was too late. Again. This fratricidal slaughter was later named the War of Tears. The spirits of Australia, who had lived in peace with the Bunyip for thousands of years, rejected the Garu almost entirely. I'm noticing something of a pattern of behavior from the Garu that may or may not be indicative of future performance. Meanwhile, the Black Spiral Dancers were finally able to enter the dream time and began corrupting the spirits of the Outback in earnest. About 50 years later, by 1986, Pentex had grown to become the largest holding company in the world. What they did not own outright, they either held majority interests in or controlling shares in. A Pentex subsidiary called Developers Forestry Group approached the Brazilian government about opening the Amazon basin to foreign investment. When the contracts were signed, Pentex's corporate paramilitaries called First Teams descended on the jungle and began wiping out all resistance. The Black Frost, a pack of Geta Fenris Garu, stumbled into a trap set by a Pentex First Team and was wiped out. Their kinfolk discovered the remains of the Black Frost, along with the quickly expanding Pentex base of operations in the Amazon, and called home for backup. This was the beginning of the hellish War of the Amazon, under the leadership of the Fenris Elder, 
Golgo Fangs first, which pulled Garu in from around the world who were hungry for battle and glory against the most obvious exercise of Pentex's service to the worm. Four years later, in 1990, a being out of nightmare awoke. That creature was Baba Yaga, the little grandmother. What had once been a tale to scare misbehaving Russian children became the scourge of every supernatural creature in Russia. The Silent Striders were the first to notice a significant decrease in the vampire population of the country. Those leeches that hadn't gone to ground were just plain, well, gone, without a trace. Two years later, the Garu of Russia discovered that they could not step sideways into the Umbra. A sorcery, worked by Baba Yaga and her followers, hardened the gauntlet between the material world and the spirit world to cut off Russia from the outside. The Shadow Curtain also drained the Gnosis not only from the Garu, but from their cairns as well. Baba Yaga then loosed her army upon the Garu. Vampires, sorcerers, mutants, and worst of all, dragons. These ancient dragons, called Zme, were the embodiment of the worm's destructive power. One Zme was powerful enough to lay entire septs of Garu low. The Silver Fangs, in the ancient days when they were at the height of their power, managed to slay one and bind the rest beneath their cairns. But one Zme, named Gregornus Deathwing, had awakened during World War II and bided its time until Baba Yaga woke up to resume its rampage. In 1994, a silver fang named Arkady Iceclaw managed to push through the hardened gauntlet and flee Russia to seek help from the silver fangs elsewhere. When Arkady returned to Russia, the leader of the silver fangs was a young Hamid Theurge named Tamara Tavarovich. She led their people against Baba Yaga's seemingly endless force. By 1998, the tide began to turn against Baba Yaga. The turning point was in June, in an event known as the White Knight's Massacre. The Garu managed to locate Baba Yaga's vampire army outside of St. Petersburg, where they slept for that day. The Garu dragged the sleeping vampires from the earth and ripped them to pieces. Elsewhere, Baba Yaga's Formori and Black Spiral Dancer allies were deserting her. The Garu then gathered all of their forces at Kursk to assault Grigorna's Deathwing while it slept. After a pitched battle, the worm beast was slain by a Fenris named Anton Nordenskald and Tamara Tavarovich, as her ancestor had once slain the Zmei, Shakala, centuries before. The loss of Grigorna's Deathwing was a crippling blow to Baba Yaga. By the end of the year, Baba Yaga would die at the hands of an unknown assassin. The Shadow Curtain then fell, and the Russian Garu were reunited with the rest of the Western Concordiate. Now, I've touched on the Week of Nightmares in 1999 in other videos. Well, its effects were felt by the Garu. In the Umbra, a great red star appeared in the night sky. The Garu called this new celestial body Antilos, or the Antisun, alternately the Eye of the Worm. Meanwhile, back in the Tellurian, the impossible happened. A pair of Metis Garu managed to reproduce. Their union created a Metis cub who was without either mental or physical deformity. Rumors spread that this cub was the prophesied perfect Metis, one of the signs of the apocalypse, who would either be a champion of Gaia or the worm. The newly crowned king of the Silver Fangs, Jonas Albrecht, launched a war against a cult of the Defiler Worm in New York known as the Seventh Generation. The Seventh Generation's stock and trade was in trafficking and abusing children. Many Garu did not even believe that the seventh generation existed, but Albrecht, during his exile, had encountered them and, as king, could launch a crusade against them. When the seventh generation was successfully destroyed and the full extent of their evil revealed, King Albrecht's deed was added to the silver record, the glyphic and oral history of the entire Garu nation. Off in Tibet, the Stargazer's prime cairn, Shigalu Monastery, came under attack by elements of the Chinese military that had been possessed by Bane spirits. These worm-possessed mutant soldiers deployed nerve gas against the stargazers, killing many before slaughtering the rest in close combat. The stargazers appealed to the other western Garu for help in retaking Shigalu, but were rejected completely. Then an offer of aid came from an unknown source, the beast courts of the east, the shapeshifters of Asia. One year later, 
in the year 2000, the Stargazers formally withdrew from the Garu Nation and joined the Beast Courts. In a surprising demonstration of rare intelligence, the Garu decided that another civil war and subsequent genocide would be counterproductive and allow the Stargazers to peacefully leave. Some Stargazers remained in the West with the understanding that any new cubs would be sent to Asia for training, but the Garu were still, effectively, down another tribe. Meanwhile, the eye of the worm only grew brighter with each passing day, an angry, red reminder that the apocalypse was imminent. So that was a general overview of the history of the Garu. Werewolf the Apocalypse is never set right with me. Just, well, there's a line between being a tragic hero and a monumental, myopic asshole. And the Garu fall way too easily into that latter category. But that's enough about our tree-hugging murder furries. Until next time.